Hello, um, my name is Oliver Ressler. I'm the curator and organizer of this exhibition, Overground Resistance. I'm very happy to introduce to you today Amanda Marsh Kaminals. Uh, she is the co director and curator of the Mutant Institute of Environmental Narratives. It's the Artistic Laboratory for Climate at Matadero in Madrid. And she, previously she directed uh, the city station of the Environmental Health Clinic by artist Natalia Jeremienko at the Center for Contemporary Culture of Barcelona, CCCB. And she founded the organization Translocalia a network of artists, curators, and designers to plan for the future through art. Uh, Amanda is an advisor to the Starts Prize program ran by the European Commission. She has worked in institutions, including the Institute of International Visual Arts in London and Casa Triangolo in Sao Paulo. And she holds a BA in Humanities from Pompeo Fabra University in Barcelona, a degree in history of art from University of Barcelona, and an MA in curating contemporary art from the RCA in London. Welcome. Um, great to have you here. I, I leave you the floor. Thank you, Oliver, for the invitation, and Elizabeth, and, and Elena, and Esther, and the free uh, round uh, Q21 exhibition space. And thank you all for being here. This, I, I have to start with a confession. This is the first uh, non-online conference that I do after one year and a half. So it's a pleasure to, to have people <laughs> uh, here no? and to not be uh, in, the in the screen. No? Let's see how it works. Um, so today, uh, I wanted to talk about narratives uh, for the ecological transition, right? Because uh, uh, Oliver invited me to engage with the exhibition from my practice. But I wanted to give you first an overview of what the session or, or how I, what I propose for, for the session today. So I've uh, divided the talk in three parts. Uh, first, I wanted to give you um, uh, this that I, I've called a preface, uh, so a, a bit of um, my standing point, no? or the strategies that I've used to, to engage the, the exhibition. And then I've um, took a series of triggers or references um, that I um, um, gathered around a specific subjects that we will discuss. And then I propose to open the floor for, for a discussion as a kind of an exquisite corpse to make the composition of these uh, triggers or, or parts that I've um, uh, gathered. So the first part, a uh, preface, um, is about uh, strategies. And um, because as Oliver um, introduced, I'm a, I'm a curator, but I've always worked in, in contexts that are not perhaps um, the usual context for a curator to be. I've been in, I, I've worked in art and cultural institutions, but in all, always in kind of uh, beta spaces that were cre were uh, conforming in the in the institu in such institutions to test uh, collaborations with with artists, with uh, scientists, uh, uh, with technology, and with parts of society. So always in this case of uh, this kind of uh, beta sp uh, spaces for collaboration. And so I see the curatorial uh, as a, the practice of interdisciplinarity. And, and uh, of course, art has a, as a centrality, but a centrality as articulator, as a catalyst, as a connector. So in this sense, uh, I always uh, been working in the in environmental issues. So my strategies approximate to those of the environmental uh, humanities. Uh, which I'm sure that uh, you know that it's a field that aims to bridge uh, the traditional uh, divides between the sciences and the humanities, uh, but also uh, the, the Western, Eastern, uh, or indigenous ways of uh, relating to the natural world, um, the, the traditional divide between nature and culture, and also as a way to um, uh, synthesize uh, different uh, methods from, from different fields. And most recently, I've been also approximating the strategies of, of environmental architecture as a field that puts uh, into uh, practice uh, uh, the, the, 
these premises of the environmental humanities through uh, what um, Dr. Niels Boudin calls the, causes, uh, the idea of a co-species landscapes or those kind of landscapes that are shaped uh, not just for humans but for non-human uh, species as well. So, so this idea of the codependence uh, of life forms uh, and earth uh, systems and the, the coexistence of alternative uh, concepts of, of landscapes. So, um, as I said, what I'm, what I'm proposing is this kind of exercise of an, an exquisite corpse where I've gathered this uh, very um, varied um, um, and triggers. Um, but there's a common thread uh, or, a, or a, um, let's say, a, a proposal, yeah, um, or an idea which is the, the need uh, for, uh, to diversify uh, environmental and uh, narrative strategies if we are to overcome the, the crisis no, or, but, over, but engage with the ecological transition that we must undertake and, um, and, and, and think of, of new possibilities of, of relating to, to non-human species. So the questions that I propose today um, are about uh, the terms of this ecological transition uh, that we must undertake. Um, so I question what environmental narrative strategies do these overground resistances articulate or use or, or foster? Uh, what imaginaries do they summon or they project or allow us to tap into and what role can our prey on that? So uh, the idea is to think about the terms we use and the imaginaries we, we produce. So um, in this sense, the first chapter or the first set of references that I propose um, are those um, are quite primitive ones, uh, in a sense, uh, if we speak about how Western society regards um, the climate emergency. Of all the environmental crises, I will uh, uh, focus mainly on the climate uh, emergency today. So um, th the first set of references are those of science. No? And well, I've, I've done a selection here that could be, it could be another selection, really. It's a selection of reports and, and, and models and scientific models uh, that talk about the, um, the, the climate crisis. But what for me is important here is to uh, think of the origin of these sources uh, of the, and of the messages. No? So the first one that I chose is one that I think that uh, we already know by now that in 1977, um, ExxonMobil, one of these first um, reports on climate, on the climate emergency, was, was made, was commissioned by uh, the oil and gas industry, ExxonMobil. In this case, they, they commissioned uh, James Black, but they also commissioned uh, top uh, uh, sciences at the time. And they invested a lot of money in, uh, into, yes, into, into investigating um, uh, the, the uh, carbon dioxide uh, emissions. So they uh, were uh, conscious of the, of the consequences before they came into the press and they spent a lot of money uh, misinforming and trying to control that narrative, no? Um, so I, after that, in 1988, there was um, a consensus for the need of this and of the IPCC for the Intergovernmental Panel on, on Climate Change, or the idea that policymakers needed to uh, have um, um, a scientific assessment uh, on their on their decisions, and so the the IPCC was was funded, and there was this original report, and uh, where they uh, already talk about uh, a warming planet and the need for international uh, cooperation. And I've put this other model here of 2006 by Isaac Held and Brian Soden, uh, which is um, um, this report on, hydrological, on the hydrological cycle uh, uh, to global warming, uh, because it's uh, still um, one of the uh, only systemic conclusions that we have about uh, about climate, no? This the, the, it was this paradigm of wet, uh, wet get wetter, dry get drier uh, paradigm, meaning that we still don't know a lot of um, um, we, we still don't have a lot of systemic uh, consequences uh, uh, on climate. And the last one to pick, a more recent one is uh, this 2019 article when uh, 11,000 scientists. 
um, uh, signed this article in the Oxford University Press and in the uh, Bioscience Journal, um, declaring uh, the, the un unequivocally the, the uh, climate emergency. So again, the, um, this uh, selection could have been another one, but um, what I think uh, it's important here as I said, is the, the messages, no? And I, will, I would like to uh, highlight the last one of the 11,000 uh, scientists, because what they say, it's, uh, they uh, of course um, uh, um, speak from science, but uh, what they say is that this entails major transformation in the ways our global uh, society functions and interacts with the natural ecosystem. So this is not anymore in the realms of uh, science, or not just in the realms of science, but on the realms of, of culture, no? But what happens, as uh, Bona uh, Conyer uh, points out, what does it mean uh, for a culture when an empirical phenomenon like climate change cannot be experienced empirically? And here I would say this applies just to the West and just uh, to the Western society and just to parts of Western society because obviously we know that a lot of, of uh, other societies are actually feeling empirically the, 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 um, um, the worst consequences of, of, of climate change. But what happens when you don't uh, get to feel empirically these worst consequences of, of uh, climate change? And therefore, uh, they need to be somehow mod modulated or mediated via data models or narrative. No? What happens uh, is, th is that when we have the narrative of science, of course, the conclusions are those of, of uh, well, co collapse uh, and, and extinction. And so this uh, produces so, uh, a disconnection in the people because mainly they feel either hopeless or guilty um, as in the Jonas uh, Stahl piece in, in, the, uh, in the exhibition, or, or they just simply negate it. No. So, um, so as, as this um, last um, uh, piece that I article that I, I quoted here by, uh, in Al Jazeera, uh, says that climate change may already affect 85% uh, of the uh, humanity. All, although this is the case, um, fighting climate change, denial uh, just with facts may, may not be uh, enough. So, but, what, but one could argue to all this that um, Western uh, uh, activism uh, has done a very good job with this kind of narratives, actually. They've reanimated this narrative, or they've, um, yes, they, they um, based on, on, on the idea of standing behind the science or uniting behind the science, they've um, done a, a lot. They've, uh, um, I, they managed to do a, a huge call uh, to action. Uh, for, for starters, and then they also act as this kind of um, narrative lobbies of some, somehow of trying to push the terms of the conversation towards the idea of emergency. No? So what I did here is um, to engage in a rapid uh, response uh, research or analysis on, on the um, um, imaginaries and the narratives of Extinction Rebellion. Um, I, again, I picked Extinction Rebellion because it's one of the um, um, collectives that uh, I, worked in my, I work in Madrid, but it could, I think it could apply to other, to other groups. So, uh, for instance, Extinction Rebellion, what uh, has done with, with this, the idea of collapse and extinction, is that, uh, of course, they still rely on an idea that uh, we need to save on this, um, for me, uh, still an old idea, no? that we have to save the planet and a future to protect. But what they've also done is to reclaim uh, the emergency uh, to the present, to retemporalize the, the uh, climate uh, crisis, no? and take it from the future and put it in the present. We are already in the climate emergency. This is happening now. Uh, the time's up, so uh, the change is now. No, it, it, there's a reclaiming of the of the present. 
And with this reclaiming of the present, they gave, a, they gave a power to the people, or the idea they uh, appealed to the collective responsibility. Our ability to respond, to, to use Edona Haraway's terms, but our ability to respond if we do so collectively. No? We are able to respond to this if we do so collectively. But, and also they've done, uh, they've reanimated this kind of narratives with a very clear call to action, no? uh, and which is uh, non-violent disruption, non-violent disobedience, and uh, interventions. But, <laughs> the, in here I would like to uh, take this uh, already legendary quote by Audre Lorde, which I'm sure that you're familiar with. The master tools will never dismantle the master house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. The comparison meaning that we, if we are trying to change a system that is largely uh, based on the idea of progress bring about by uh, science, uh, we need more than scientific uh, narratives to uh, change it and to propose uh, a different uh, future. So uh, here we go to the, into the second uh, chapter, which is called The End because uh, this is something that uh, Western uh, activism uh, is realizing, uh, that we need, uh, other, we need to listen and amplify uh, non-Western non and non-scientific uh, voices if we are to, to survive uh, this emergency. And here I, I brought, uh, I don't know if, if any of you saw it, but last, a month, well, some weeks ago, there was this uh, Brazilian uh, Senate, um, in the Brazilian Senate, uh, uh, intervened uh, Greta Thunberg and then Samela uh, Saterimawe. Greta Sam and Greta Thunberg was precisely pointing at, at that, no? at, uh, at the idea that uh, we cannot bring about uh, a genuine change just uh, from our Western perspective, and that we should uh, uh, amplify uh, the, voice, the voices, for instance, of the, the uh, Amazonian uh, struggle. No? And so Samela Saterimawe talked at the, at, the, at, at the Senate as well, and uh, uh, intervened in these terms. No? And, I, and I would like to quote her. Um, we are here as biomes. We are the Amazonia, we are Katinga, we are Crown, we are wetland, and we, indigenous women, are the cure of the earth. We, young indigenous people, are the, aim, the main actors of change. And in similar terms, um, express um, uh, Kathy Jadnil Kishiner and Akani Viana, I'm, I'm not sure if I've pronounced their, their name uh, well, but it's uh, two of the artists of this show, precisely, which I don't know if you had the chance to see this work, but I really um, I recommend it, uh, strongly recommend to, to watch it. It will be much better than me talking about it. Um, but anyway, in similar terms, they, um, they express uh, themselves in, in similar uh, terms in this uh, beautiful uh, poem. And I just took some uh, parts of this because I wanted to highlight uh, some of the messages, no? some of the most important messages that, that they say. And, and they say, Sister of ice and snow, I'm coming to you from the land of my ancestors, from sunken volcanoes, from undersea the scent of sleeping giants. Sister of ocean and sun, I welcome you to the land of my ancestors, where they sacrificed their life to make mine possible. You think you have, and then they, they speak to us, you think you have decades before your home falls beneath tides. We have years, we have months, before you sacrifice us again, before you watch us from your TV screens and computer screens to see if we're still breathing while you do nothing. My sister, I offer you these rocks as a reminder, as a reminder that our lives matter more than their power that life in all forms deserves the same respect we all give to money, that these issues will affect all, and every one of us, none of us, is immune. 
and that each and every one of us has to decide if we will rise. So uh, from this uh, message, there's uh, three ideas that I would like to, to highlight. No? There are these repeated uh, references to their ancestors as part of uh, the human species, as, as part of a human species that protected their lands and their, and their seas just because they had a responsibility with, with the uh, future uh, generations. Um, also, uh, there's the, this always uh, present multi-species perspective or the importance of all life forms and uh, the um, reference to, uh, colonialist, to the colonialist struggle that they, they had to endure and, and overcome. And precisely uh, re in relation to this last, um, uh, this last message, no? the, the references to the, to the colonialist uh, struggle, is what um, Eduardo, uh, anthropologist Eduardo Viveiro de Castro uh, has been, de Castro, sorry, has been uh, saying for a, for a long uh, time now, is that uh, Amerindians may offer us a project for the future, not a memory of the past, based on the idea that um, now that the world we, we all know, um, um, or most of us know, uh, is ending, it may be the time to pay more attention to the experiences of those whose world uh, has already ended, uh, because there's about uh, 300 million uh, or, or more, depending on, on how we count it, uh, indigenous people on the planet, and most of them are survivors of uh, colonialism. So based on this, Eduardo Viveros de Castro proposed that we look into them as a, a project for the future. And together with um, philosopher Deborah Danowski, they wrote uh, this uh, fantastic book. I don't know, uh, is any of you familiar with it or have has read it? Yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe we can discuss later. So it's a wonderful book in which they um, talk about uh, narratives. Well, it's, it's a wonderful book, but it's, uh, the translation is not uh, so good, I have to say, because the original title is uh, Amundos por vir, or uh, Is there worlds to come? And the translation uh, is um, The Ends of the World. So basically what they're, what they're saying is that um, as the environmental and civilization crisis become evident, new versions and updated revisions of uh, this ancient idea in, in the Western world of the end of the world proliferate. And what they do in the book is uh, they analyze some, um, some of these uh, narratives of the end of the world, and they uh, compare them to worldviews and cosmologies uh, of uh, Amerindians or of, or of indigenous uh, uh, people. And and in an attempt for a more uh, plural uh, mythology, you know, updated to, to our times, and, and in an attempt to radicalize a little bit the, the, the debate on the environmental uh, crisis. And basically what they um, put forward is that the end of the wall or the destruction of uh, life, um, it, it barely exists in the narratives of, of Amerindians. So, uh, um, and in, in the in the cosmologies, even um, the um, some of of the of the narratives that has come into mass media uh, through mass media, like the Maya calendar, no, like like okay, the the end of the world was supposed to be in in 2012, but then oh no, there was a miscalculation. We just miscalculated it, and no, the Maya didn't want to say that the, the end of the world was in 2012. They said it was in 2020, and then we postponed, and there the, was this kind of, uh, I mean, and and all this was a, a, a mis, uh, not a miscalculation, but a misunderstanding of. The actual, of what the actual Maya calendar meant. Um, as the Maya calendar, it's, uh, what it really is, it's the end of a cycle, but it's the end of a cycle where, when you, um, after this, this cycle, you're supposed to gain um, 
in, in your conscious, no? And in, in, anyway, it's not the end of the of the world, the world, no? So, to retake one of the of the of the first questions that I that I pose, no? Uh, what's the role of, of art in all this? And, and what are the terms of the ecological transition must un undertake? No? Um, because what uh, this exhibition over ground resistances points at uh, is at one of the crucial uh, roles of art in all of this, no? and it's uh, art as a device uh, at the center of the environmental activism, or art uh, taking environmental activism as its main material, as Jay Jordan puts in one of the uh, fantastic uh, films, or art at the service of activism, as uh, Marta uh, Muñoz from Extinction Rebellion Spain more radically puts it. No? And uh, it also exposes the ethics of it, no? of this role uh, of art, that this role of art uh, implies. So now I would like to talk about other possible uh, roles of, of art that art can have in this ecological transition. And for that, I, I would like to be in the company of this uh, work by, by uh, Katie Patterson, uh, which is already from, from 2008. Maybe, maybe you are uh, familiar with, with it. Um, and, and also in the company of environmental scientist uh, Federica Ravera, who uh, starts her talks uh, asking to the, to the audience, what is more significant in terms of understanding the melting of the, of the glaciers? Is it the, the data, which is, which is what passes into the present then to us? Or is the sound of ice falling into the, into the ocean? No? And in this, uh, so this, uh, she, she tries to, they try to point towards the, this need for a more uh, affective or sensitive or sometimes, um, yes, affective and sensitive ways of communicating or sometimes uh, towards a sense of humor, no? Uh, of stories that tap into our collective imagination. And the, in the same line, uh, Liam Young, but mo uh, he's more focused on urban transformations for the, for the ecological transition, but he uh, talks about, about, about this, um, the, the importance of narrative like this. No? In films, games, and literature, we've always imagined alternative worlds as a means to understand our own world in new ways. Sometimes, moments, places, or cities are best understood by examining the stories we construct about them. So, in other words, could other imaginaries lead to different futures? As if we humans were going to survive uh, to all this, uh, and we were going to ask ourselves what comes next, uh, can we propose, can we put forward more desirable imaginaries how do these planetary multi-species societies look like, no? for instance? So based on, this, on, this, on these questions or thinking of, of these kind of narratives, in uh, 2018, uh, we founded in Madrid the Mutant Institute of Environmental Narratives, which, is, which was an initiative at first um, that three uh, institutions put forward on the one hand, uh, the um, Center for Contemporary Culture, uh, Matadero Madrid, um, but also the um, uh, Climate uh, Change Office of the Environmental Area of the Madrid City Council, so directly the, the, yeah, the area that, that deals with climate change in the City Council, and the University of Madrid, the Technical University of Madrid, and specifically um, an organization in the university that is an interdisciplinary center, is the Center for Innovation and, and in Technology for, for Development of the Technic University. 
And the idea was that there was a, the challenge was that there was a, a disconnection no, between um, Madrid society or large, a large part of Madrid society and uh, scientific data or the ways uh, the, uh, we were communicating um, the climate um, emergency and, 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 in, and in very specific uh, issues as well. No? And there was also a lack of uh, interdisciplinary and, and experimental artistic uh, production because we, have, we had and we have a, a lot of uh, programs uh, on the environmental crisis, very good ones as well, but um, there's not a lot of uh, transdisciplinary spaces where, where joint uh, research uh, with, uh, with different actors uh, and where art could have a leading uh, role um, could take place no? in a long-term uh, basis. And, and so we decided to create the, the Newton Institute. And uh, after that, we entered into a different kind of, of platform, of working platform, uh, which is uh, uh, the Madrid Demonstrations of, of Clean and Healthy City. It has, it's a platform uh, set up by the European Institute of, of uh, Technology and uh, a community for knowledge in innovation that they call a climate kick, but this is not so. The important uh, part of this, uh, of the idea of getting into this kind of platform, is that it's a platform that supports 15 cities toward, towards a very uh, specific, uh, 15 European cities towards a very specific mission or goal, which is to reach the climate neutrality by uh, 2050. And to do that, they require for the city councils to uh, engage on it by um, putting forward a roadmap towards this uh, climate neutrality as, the, as what they call the problem owners. So the city council, as the problem owner, needs to uh, bring forward this. Uh, in this case, in our case, it's still a very technical uh, document. Um, that is the, this roadmap for the climate neutrality of the city by uh, uh, 2050. So the idea is that we all work together, the civil servants for, uh, for the, of the city council, um, um, uh, a scientist uh, from, the, from the university, anthropologists from, from the university, architects, and us in Matadero, curators and, and artists, but towards the same um, goal, no? in, in this uh, multi-stakeholder platform that has this portfolio approach. That, uh, um, the idea is that we have a, a variety of different projects that are uh, interconnected. So the Institute, which is the Artistic Laboratory for Climate Action, um, was um, in, in all this context, uh, what we wanted to do is to create and consolidate this uh, space for experimental and transdisciplinary research and, and action for these diverse uh, uh, agents to, to work together. No? And to analyze the, uh, existing imaginaries, the ones that, are, uh, some, some of them, the ones that I've uh, laid out, uh, creating and communicating new collective imaginaries and uh, do participated research and production of, of specific adaption projects for, for the city. So the first uh, project, the first experiment we engaged on was the cyborg garden, is the cyborg garden. So um, the cyborg garden uh, was a first experiment that first of all served as a kind of testing ground to find um, a common language for very for agents that normally don't, don't, don't work together. No? So for us, um, the idea was to renaturate the spaces of Matadero. I don't know if any of you have been to Madrid and to Matadero. No. Well, is this, this is space that you see here, and it's, it used to be an old slaughterhouse that in 2007 was reconverted to, to the cultural center. So as you see here, there's not a lot of um, shadow uh, spaces or green spaces. And the, so the idea was to renaturate it to be a, to make it a, a kinder a space um, for humans and, and on humans and to be able to support or to stand better the uh, urban heat island 
uh, that affects uh, especially uh, to the south of Madrid where, Ma where Matadero is. So for us, we wanted to create this cyborg garden where, where to, um, to, to create prototypes with the artist um, but also to, to have a place where to speak uh, of, or, or where to create a new narrative. But for um, uh, a big part of the platform, this was a nature-based solution uh, project for the adaption to the, the climate change. So um, we started by um, a series of interdisciplinary focus groups that were led by these artists and, and architects. But uh, also what we uh, wanted to do with the cyber garden is for it to be a space, as I say, to create new narratives, no? a space uh, to, for, to talk about us uh, care and desire with um, some of the communities that we were already working, about mutualism, uh, about non-human architectures, about the relation of the relationship between nature and technologies as a as a hybrid one, or about interspecies uh, relations, and then um, the cyborg garden was paired with uh, this other project, Lifei uh, TV series, which is um, a se um, project for a a series. On, on the, on the, the naturation processes that were going on in the city. So not just the cyber garden, but other projects that, that are going on in the, in, the, in the city and that the, the platform is, is fostering. No? So the idea was to invite five artists and filmmakers to work with us in the, in the Madrid Deep Demonstrations team in our, in our platform to reflect on how it would be um, the future of cities like Madrid after undergoing through extreme um, rewilding, extreme rewilding processes. No? So, but by doing so, by inviting the, the artists to work with, with such a diverse team, we soon realized that uh, art was not just um, creating or, or fostering new narratives, but it was also acting with um, as what I like to call a, a, a soft uh, disruptor. And I, I'm going to give you some specific examples of, of this idea of the soft disruptor. For instance, in the Cli-Fi uh, TV series, um, so in, in, the, in the platform, in the Deep Demonstrations platform, we work um, in the realm of the idea of sustainable development, right? The idea which is still uh, largely um, trusts the, um, the uh, human exceptionalism no? uh, the, or, or the possibilities of humans to adapt and to overcome this crisis through design. But through the Clifi TV series, we uh, introduce through fiction and through speculative design into the team some other ideas like the conservation of specific parts of nature or the idea of the sustainable retreat, the idea that maybe perhaps um, there's no such thing as a sustainable development and maybe we should think of other ways of doing this uh, transition. So for instance, in the first episode, uh, which was, uh, is directed by, by Liam Young. He proposed the Madrid Planet City, which is part of a, another, a larger city uh, uh, he's working on. And he proposed this. Um, what if we had to rebuild Madrid in the space of two blocks so the rest of the space of the city could be rewildered? Okay, so it's an, a, an exercise of, of, uh, of fiction, of course. Um, uh, and of speculative design, because he, he works from, from architecture as well, and so all the projects are very heavily uh, researched, and he worked with, uh, with, our, with the team of the uh, Madrid demonstrations. And amongst uh, other things, he, in one of the sessions, um, one of the questions that he asked was, okay, how, how much green do we need to to capture all the carbon dioxide no, of the, of the, that we are emitting today 
do we, would, would it be enough if we rebuild the, 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 the city in, two, in just two blocks and then the rest is green? And, and then all of a sudden we realized that nobody had asked that question, you know, how much green do we need to, to capture all the, or, or to, to achieve climate uh, neutrality? So this question was not, was not there. Um, with the cyber garden, um, it's, I say that it acts as a sub-disruptor as well because uh, Matadero is in a, a space that it's catalogued as heritage and it's in the middle of a, it's also, so catalogued as heritage means that you can't touch a stone uh, in theory, um, but it's also in the middle of a renaturation uh, process of the river Manzanares, which is, uh, you can see a patch of green behind the, the buildings and then a, another a kind of, uh, green, uh, bluish strap, that's the Manzanares River. So um, we started to, to ask questions like, would regulation apply to art in urban context? No? If, if it's considered art, can we renaturate all this space that in theory it's not possible because of um, it's considered heritage? Or who are the owners of this, of this new, the new, garner, the new garden? Who is responsible for its maintenance? No? And lastly, I wanted to put a last example of, of art working uh, as a soft uh, disruptor in this kind of context, which is uh, the city station, another project that I, I worked on before the, the institute. And that departed from this question that you see here, how made culture and institutions act as propositional devices for the ecological transition rather than simply commentators of a nearby collapse? Um, this question was posed because we were at the time working on the exhibition after the end of the war, and it was the time of the COP21 where Barcelona had just signed, uh, agreed to sign uh, the, the limitation of, of, of emissions, and there was a huge polemic in, in the city. No? So when we um, uh, we're creating this exhibition, we, uh, the uh, exhibition department director and the curators, uh, we all decided that this exhibition couldn't stay in the exhibition spaces, but had to go uh, to the street and act in a, and, and you know, articulate a different kind, kind of space, no? So we created this series of infrastructures as part of the environmental health clinic uh, I don't know if you, if any of you know uh, artist Natalia Jeremyshenko, but she, um, a while ago now, she created the Environmental Health Clinic, uh, which is, so she started in New York, um, creating this kind of mobile infrastructures. And the idea, she departed from the premise that to treat the, the inner, our health, we must to cure the inner, to cure our health, we must treat the outer, no? So we must take care, so basically uh, linking or connecting uh, the environmental crisis to, to health, no? And so, so this series of infrastructures, um, we created the city station and it, it was used as um, a space for a program of, of activities uh, and uh, of citizen social science as actions that were articulated together with a, a part of the scientific community of, of Barcelona. Uh, and they, they, gave, they created a series of recipes that the um, citizens could use uh, to improve uh, the, the environment. No? One of these actions was uh, XR in which uh, it was a, a, a huge citizen uh, science action with uh, the participation of, of uh, schools from the, the 10 districts of Barcelona of, with 2,000 uh, children and their, and their families. And at the time we had just um, eight stations in, in the city to measure the, the air quality. And as I said, it was, there was, a, it, it was a sensitive uh, subject, the, the air quality, because um, well, we're not, we were not complying with the European Union uh, regulations and, and, and so on, but it was, uh, it was a very sensitive uh, subject at the moment. No? So we, uh, through the city station and through the, uh, this artistic um, context, let's say, we managed to, to do this massive uh, uh, action 
to install 800 sensors and uh, to present, uh, so for the children to present the results, the very bad results, uh, to the mayor uh, of the city. And lastly, um, the city station was uh, created uh, together with this uh, association, Taula Espera Quart, uh, which maps uh, and recuperates empty lots of the Poblenou area of Barcelona, which is an area that is also called uh, 22 Arroba because it's where um, a lot of uh, technology and innovation companies, big companies, are um, being installed or they are, yeah, they are landing there. And there's a huge project, process of gentrification uh, from, uh, let's say, uh, 15 years ago, something, from something like that. So this association maps these spaces and recuperates it. So in this case, there was this negotiation process of the neighborhood association, the, the Taula Espera Quart, to, uh, with the city council. And in this case, the city station became kind of, of tool or device or um, yeah, a, a, a device for, for this uh, negotiation. So in the end, the, so uh, basically, we, we created the, the infrastructures and at the same time, the, the neighborhood, the neighbors were asking, okay, so these infrastructures are going to be created, but we need uh, water, we need electricity, we, we need uh, a, a series of, they had a series of demands for that space uh, and for that space to be, um, um, yes, um, a, a common space for, for them to, to, to take it, no? And, and that's what it, it happened in the end. For the last chapter and talking about art as a sub disruptor, um, I entitled it more like a pill because I wanted to um, speak about the role of, of art uh, institutions or cultural institutions because for art to be acting in such manner, for art to be a soft disruptor, it must, uh, there, there must be a specific context, no? Um, so I brought this, uh, quote by an int interview that the that curator Hans Ulrich Obrist did to um, uh, artist Mariana Simnet, and that inspired me a lot uh, at the beginning when, when in the creation of the institute. And Hans Ulrich asks, her, asks Mariana, how does the institution of the future look like for you? And so Mariana replies, imagine it as something that doesn't, doesn't need space or walls to exist. Think of it more as a pill something that you may simply take and it exists within you, allowing you to be part of a larger superorganism. But the question is what kind of superorganism, right? So um, thinking of, of this and of the ideas of cooperative resilience and the illusion of destructive competitions, we started in a project in the, in the institute uh, to research on, on the idea of collective intelligence, because we were talking a lot about um, yeah, innovating in, in interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary spaces with, a, with an active role of art and about new methodologies, but okay, what, what does this mean? Or how do we art articulate new uh, collective intelligence? No? And most of the research that was done on collective intelligence was um, MIT's report, well, part of the MIT, um, uh, collective intelligence center, which was very linked to the to the market, and we are we were also very interested in, on play as a key element uh, of of learning processes. No, so we contacted. We started to work with artist Paula Nishijima, who uh, was at the time, and she's still um, uh, working or researching on uh, super colonies of ants, which. Uh, unlike most uh, most uh, ants family, the majority of, of ants fight uh, fight to death between different families. But the super colonies of ants um, don't. They cooperate. They exchange a kind of scent and, and cooperate. So she was uh, studying the dynamics of these super colonies of ants, and we also got in touch and started uh, research with Audrey Dusutur, who is one of the leading. 
uh, scientists of this uh, mole, this uh, yellow mole here, uh, Leb called Leblop or Fisarum polycephalum, which is a unicellular thousand set slime mole uh, that it doesn't have a brain, but it has, uh, they discovered the ability to, to learn and not, all, not just learn, but uh, it has the, the ability to pass these learnings to another slime mole. Uh, so working with, with both of them, we created this game based on the topology of nets, uh, and the aim, the aim is basically the aim of the game is basically um, look out for the resilience of the net, no? according to the circumstances and types of nets, uh, if they are centralized, decentralized, or distributed. No? And it's a game that, uh, for the moment, we just uh, have it. Uh, it's just. Um, an analogic game, uh, it's not uh, digital, but it's been tested by some public in, in an exhibition, a big exhibition that we did, the Covisionarios, and uh, by um, this MA in systems organization at the, at the UPM. No? And I think that I leave it here for the references, and I'll go into the, I'll open the floor for us to, to talk a little bit. Um, uh, and see if we can make sense of all these, all these references that I've uh, laid out. And um, maybe, well, I'll, I'll retake the, the questions no, of the beginning. What are the terms of the ecological transition we must undertake now? Or, and what kind of environmental narrative strategies do these overground resistances articulate? And, and imaginaries, of course, and what's the role of art? No? What, what role can art play on all this? So, yeah, thank So, um, the thing is that we approach specific communities according to the uh, projects and to the objectives in relation to the, to the roadmap and, and the general portfolio that I told about. So, I don't really believe in the idea of um, of okay, of let's 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 do this project for a public in general, and let's see who comes. You know, there's always uh, the question: of who is this for? You no, know? um, and so for instance, in in this case, rheology, uh, we created uh, because there was uh, at the time. Um, this is in 2019. So there was this um, renaturation process of the Manzanares River, which is, uh, well, you can see it here. It's a very, it's a river that it doesn't have a, a lot of uh, water. So during a lot of time, uh, there was this complex uh, by politicians in the city, uh, like some years ago, that uh, for, because the river was very, very low, there, there was no um, a lot of water, so they put dams to make it uh, to have more water. But then uh, the whole uh, ecological corridor was lost because, of course, you you would have pools, just uh, pools without without life. No, so they did uh, in 2016. They did a renaturation process, but um, the since um, this was um, so the the, um, the river was uh, was abandoned before that. It was also at the backs of of the um, uh, society of the of, of part of the uh, Madrid society in, in, in that specific area. No? So the, we did this approximation, this uh, this uh, uh, project to uh, first. I analyze the renaturation uh, process and see how how the uh, how it was reacting as an ecologic uh, corridor, uh, but also to to bring attention to the to this area, no, as a shared uh, space for for the communities uh, there. So we work with with artists uh, Robertina Shevinic, but with also with some. Um, with well, with our teams uh, of uh, in in the platform, and with some communities that Intermedia, this other program was was already working on, and we did um, this. Uh, so we created a kind of a booklet 
uh, with different strategies of approximating the, the river. So there was some scientific protocols on uh, the contamination of air, uh, so the air quality contamination of the waters, uh, but also there was, uh, we worked with CO bird, lights, bird life, uh, so to observe the different uh, fauna, etc. And also Robertina proposed a series of um, empathic, what she called empathic strategies of approximation to the river for the different um, communities. No? So in this case, it was a, a very concrete theme of a long-term research that culminated in this uh, citizen, citizen science um, uh, action. But uh, I would say that in general lines, it depends, it depends on the project. On the and in the, on the on also on the objectives, no, of the um, and in relation to the to, to the portfolio of, of projects, no, that because the idea is that they are they will they have to be interconnected to at, to act at different uh, in different layers of the city. I don't know whether I replied to your question. Or, yeah. So there's there's uh, intermediae, for instance. There's also uh, from the uh, in the Madrid demonstration, we also have democratic society who uh, helps us uh, by with organizing what we call the communities of practice for a specific projects. So uh, okay, uh, when, once we um, have specific projects. We, uh, we, uh, we see in the, in the area in which we are um, acting and identify the agents, the civic agents that should be there, uh, the civic associations, or the, and they help us do this, uh, democratic society. Um, and, and yeah. The final sentence on your final slide was what role can art play on it, and it is a transition. And um, if I look uh, from my point of view, what we see in the art, the exhibitions, it's more or less a description of what is, or what might be, <coughs> this topic viewpoints, but is art really able to contribute in providing actions, in providing solutions? So if we look at all these conferences which establish goals, or as a state are allowed to define goals, and all these precise actions are not in these documents, and as far as I see, can see art also has no chance to really present solutions for the I don't believe in the solutionist approach um, because this this is a um, this is a very scientific approach, right? You have a problem you analyze it and you find a solution. And you normally, um, thank you. And you normally approach it from certain categories. And, and you approach it from, from certain uh, categories that need to give you um, a, a well-tied uh, solution. So, and it's, and it's the same logics of of the disciplines, right? It's it's um, so we we have disciplines. We have uh, these uh, small boxes, no, that um, do their work and 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 find solutions for very specific pro problems that the, that that don't overlap or that they don't uh, interact between one another. Or we assume because we we. Um, uh, isolate the problem, not to solve it, to, and to find a solution. But I, I think that that's part, or what I was trying to say, that that's part of uh, the problem that we have, is that we don't connect the, 
we, we don't treat it in its whole complexity. And to treat this emergency in, in, its, in its whole complexity, we need to understand that it's not, of course, art doesn't have any chance to find a solution. Of, it's, no, art in itself won't find a solution for the climate emergency. But uh, no one will, actually. I mean, it's a matter, for me, it's a matter of understanding its complexity and treating its complexity with a lot of different knowledges, a lot of different strategies, and, and they may not be the ones that we are used to uh, or that, that we are more familiar to. They may not be the ones of science that isolate a problem and find a solution. They may not be... Um, so, so I think that what art can really do is, first of all, act, as I said, as an articulator, as a connector of, of these knowledges, and that I've seen uh, in my experience, and that's what I try to uh, bring here. Um, but that, it, that works. So from, from, the, from, an artistic, from the artistic experimentation, you can bring together um, disciplines, knowledges, agents that normally don't, don't mix, don't work together, and if they do, they're just, not all of them, of course, but um, they want to write their article or do their paper, and you know, and, and don't, uh, um, perhaps they don't, don't um, ask questions in the ways that art do. So, so that's, that's what I think uh, art can do. Uh, yeah. Um, so I was wondering, you mentioned um, the idea of disruption and also with the um, time span, so and the terminology used is pretty radical and the like, catastrophe and crisis. Um, but by, like in the past years, as you were also showing in one graph, I think we are experiencing the rise of those um, very alarming vocabulary. So I'm wondering, what are you thinking? What could be, what are radical, or what is there? What would be radical strategies, or which vocabulary do we need in terms for the um, because because of the short time span and because of it is that urgent, but also um, the very confrontative methods might not be the best strategies to approach it. So, um, how would you define um, the radicality of? Um, and the ecological transformation. Because transformation, that's the question also you ask how we feel about it. It has this feeling of everything already exists and we just have to like kind of also change stuff and also innovate stuff. But it for me um, maybe might be lacking the connotation of disruption and um, blocking and yeah, so I'm wondering how you feel about those strategies. Mm. I'm not sure I, I got the whole question, eh? but um, uh, so for me, yes, you're right that there's there's this um, whole uh, very radical uh, vocabulary, no, or, or these these terms of of, of disruption and and that uh, confront, confrontation may not be. Uh, um, the best uh, strategy, no, or, or or not just confrontation. I mean, I think I think we need this kind of disruption, but we need other strategies as well. Um, so these other uh, kind of strategies, uh, I wouldn't be able to tell you what what vocabulary I would I would use, uh, other than than what I. I presented no, but what I really think is that. <laughs> um, that there needs to be um, spaces where to find these common languages. Um, they, they, and, they, and I insist, maybe, but what I've seen is they, they, they don't, uh, they are not so abundant, these uh, spaces of, of, let's say, soft confrontation or, or or what the, the idea of, of what uh, Chantal Mouffe understands as the political, no? For, for her, the, for Chantal Mouffe, the political is a space of conflict, but not necessarily a space of, com of, of this um, radical um, 
uh, disruptions and, and confrontations, but a space where conflict and disagreement can exist uh, and can be worked upon and we can find um, a common uh, ground from where to start uh, thinking of what a desirable future could could mean. No? Um, so yeah. Hi, uh, I had a question about the last uh, question. What role did that play in that? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I think that it's kind of uh, about raising awareness, the role of art, but how can you, like, we're here kind of in an art exhibition, but I think we're already aware. It. So uh, you cannot raise awareness on people already. You're preaching the capitalists. So, when, when you take that? Hmm. Uh, that, uh, that's what I, I was what I, what I think is that it's not just about raising awareness. Uh, art, it's not just about raising uh, awareness and about commentating what's, what's happening. What I'm saying is that art can have uh, a role on actively proposing um, through a lot of, of uh, tactics, no? speculative design, uh, fiction on itself, the exercises of fiction with very different, with very, very different people, sense of humor, affective and, and sensitive kinds of communication. It, has, it can have an active role on, 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 on the imaginers we construct about the future. It's not about rising, just about rising awareness on the, on the state of the world. It's about, um, because we have a difficult task, before our eyes, we 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 didn't we we didn't get the solution yet. No, we didn't get the the. We have some examples. We have every day more examples of things, of proposals that are working and outside. They are working outside the the capitalist uh, system or almost uh, outside. No, we have some ex some very good examples in the. In, in the exhibition, we, we have Jay Jordan uh, from ZAD, we have, but we have m m every day more, more examples no, of, of things that are working. But in kind of molecular uh, levels or, or small, small scales yet, no? we, we didn't figure out how to uh, scale this up to, to our um, huge population of, of human beings. No? Uh, and that I think that given the right context, uh, given the opportunity and the space, art can really um, help with that. Just a little one of the artworks which is shown in the exhibition, maybe not even Bessel may also comment on this. One of this artwork shows uh, the front of banks which is splashed by colors. And um, one of your terms was art as a negotiation device. And uh, do you think this is helpful in a democracy <laughs> if you want to get some support from a large number of people to work in this transition uh, that you cover the front of banks. No, you, you mean that the... Say, yeah. say, say. Uh, and here in, in, in one of the Extinction Rebellions... Um, ah, I don't have it here. Uh, yes, but th that's, that's not... I, I would consider this, no? This, you were referring to this or to, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's, um, well, it's a form of protest. It's a, it's a form of, of protest and it's this, um, this one role that art can, can have that we were talking uh, about earlier, which is to get in the center of, of um, 
activist action. That's just one of the roles that art can have, that art can play. Um, and I think uh, this exhibition uh, reflects on it uh, wonderfully, you know, um, this, this kind of um, movements um, gain a lot from the creativity of arts, no? Um, Extinction Rebellion, for instance, they talk about themselves not just an, uh, as an activist movement, but also as an artistic one. So that's just one of the roles that art can play. Um, I'm, what I'm just, and I would like to insist on that, is that there needs to be more, and there needs to be spaces where art can directly dialogue with uh, the policy makers, with the people who are doing the transformations in the cities, etc. But because that's not a usual space where, where art can, can have a voice. So that's why um, I'm arguing for that. <laughs> if I may also reply to this, uh, to this answer. Mm. Um, yes. I mean, in this exhibition, Overground Resistance, I tried to present a variety of different artist practices that in different ways uh, can be seen as part of a climate movement and they take over different roles within the movement. And I think there are certain divisions of labor in movements and there are some people who uh, do the work of destruction, which in the case of Sede is at least a symbolic destruction of uh, the main funders of climate destruction. And uh, there are people who are engaged more in building, building alternatives, uh, building uh, our decarbonized, more democratic and more inclusive and more just futures. And I don't see really a distinction I mean, I don't see really a competition between these two aspects because I see a necessity of both. I see the necessity of making it impossible for the worst polluters to continue their destructive activities. This is a means of survival. Uh, to, uh, not to allow building further uh, uh, structures that uh, destroy our planet. But on the other hand, I think we need to create these spaces where we build up our alternatives. And uh, the piece that's usually presented on this wall of the uh, 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 Jay Jordan and Isabel of Frameur, uh, that focuses on the Zad, where this uh, resistance against a new airport and the building of alternatives, they come together quite, uh, quite well, but uh, probably we need thousands of more of these sad uh, places, sad spaces. <laughs> and I agree, so I'm not going to comment further because you put it beautifully. <laughs> okay, thank you. And uh, yeah, please feel welcome to approach us uh, if you want to talk to us uh, uh, in, a, in a small group. Okay. Thank you.